Okay. Uh, good morning or afternoon, evening, wherever you may be. Um, I'm Stephanie Walda from the Global Change Research Institute, and I'd like to welcome you to the third plenary session on net zero emissions targets. We have three speakers um, talking about net zero targets for the EU, China, and the United States. First up will be Tom Van Ireland, then Jen K. June, and finally Joe Aldi. They'll each be giving 10-minute presentations, and we will have uh, open discussion at the end. Um, and please post your questions as we go along in the Q&A session, not the chat. Um, please, if, if you would like to, direct them to a specific speaker. Um, just put the name and say, um, if it's a general question for everyone, that's fine too. And I would also ask you not to use the thumbs up button in the Q&A, um, just because it changes the order of the questions and that can get a little confusing um, to know what's new and what's not. Um, so with that, I'll welcome Tom Van Heerland. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, thanks for the Integrated Assessment Modeling Consortium to invite me. I, I tend to be um, sometimes a participant and uh, a strong, um, yeah, supporter of the, the need to have um, modeling tools that can integrate different sectors to look at different challenges for this kind of, uh, yeah, cross-sectoral and in a way global challenge. Uh, so in that way, very happy to see that uh, the consortium could meet in this special year where clearly physical meetings are, are difficult, if not impossible. Um, I had present, uh, prepared a few slides, but it seems my connection is not that good, so I'll simply talk through them. Um, we talk today about, or this session is about net zero uh, achievement. And I think that is a quite interesting topic right now. We see a lot of developments globally of different regions starting to look at, okay, what does it mean for us as an economy to achieve uh, net zero greenhouse gas emissions? Uh, in the EU, we started this process in 2018 uh, when the commission came forward with a communication presenting its vision for a, a long-term strategy. Uh, the Commission at the time indicated that it thought uh, we needed to be ambitious in the EU and look at the achievement of net zero greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 2050. And I have to say that was a very interesting year, notably the year 2019. Um, we had, I would say, really a, a societal debate in Europe. Uh, for me, working in Brussels, that was often translated into discussions in council formations. Uh, where we discussed, okay, what would it mean to go to net zero GHG? And that was quite interesting. We were discussing this in very different uh, council formations, not just the one dealing with environment, but also energy, also um, agriculture, also transport, also industry, also finance. Uh, and even in the Defense Council, this was discussed. So it took a really broad debate, and I think that was also represented in the societal debate at large. And the conclusion was that, yes, we should go for net zero GAG by 2050. And by March 2020, we submitted that uh, to the UNFCC as our long-term strategy. Um, that has increased, I would say, reflections in Europe how to get there. And I think that is, in a way, the key element. Once you consider it's doable, then starting to think, okay, what are then the policies that really make that shift? Because we will have to provide for incentives to make the shift. And that, I think, is the important part of what we call the 2030 Climate Target Plan uh, that the Commission uh, brought for forward recently, where we are proposing to actually increase climate ambition for 2030 in the EU to a net, an at least net 55% greenhouse gas reduction target compared to 2030. Um, as you know, we are heavy consumers of the kind of tools uh, you have been discussing over the last days in the uh, in the meeting, uh, but we have a, a quite uh, elaborate impact assessment again, trying to look at what that means for uh, the different sectoral changes. And I won't go into too much detail here, but I think it had some interesting elements. Um, some sectors can do a lot between now and 2030. Some sectors will do more after 2030 and how to prepare for that. And an example is electricity where we think the transformation will continue to be rapid with the largest reductions by 2030 already, but also buildings. And I know this sometimes is a discussion point, but in the end, we think the technology exists to reduce in buildings. It's only an issue about how to get um, 
re renovation rates up, how to make sure that these renovations are deep, how to make sure that there is, once people change their boilers, one goes to really improved efficiency or even climate neutral boilers. But if we could manage to do that, it could be a sector where we can see high reductions already in the next 10 years. Sectors where it's more difficult are road transport and transport in general and industry. And that raises often the question, okay, what policies do you put in place in the short term that not only drive reductions in the short term, but also kickstart the developments you need in the long term? Uh, I think for transport, there are some clear answers on that now. Uh, I think, uh, for instance, a policy in Europe related to CO2 and cars is clearly seen as promoting the deployment of uh, zero emission cars, such as electric cars, linked to um, changes in, and I'll come back to that, uh, carbon pricing and linked to uh, the rollout of infrastructure. We hope that that really will make sure that there can be a switch at some time for deep penetration of net zero emis emission vehicles in our car stock, but that will see the biggest shift in reductions only after 2030. Industry, a similar issue, significant potential still, 25% we think in the next 10 years, often related to efficiency improvement and some fuel switching, but how to go to the real deep decarbonization, think about hydrogen deployment, think about CCS, and therefore the need for a whole bunch of innovation and deployment policies at the same time. Um, how we have translated that, Oh, sorry, one more thing I want to stress is yeah, non-CO2 and LULUCF, but certainly LULUCF, so land use in Europe, where we actually see a deterioration in our land use sink. That has occurred already in the inventory the last few years. But if we look at the national projections by member states, this actually gets, well, it gets worse in a way. The sink is continuing to decrease in the next 10 years in the EU. So that raises the question, okay, we will have to reverse that, also with a view to make sure we have sufficient removals by 2030. So policies focused on basically reversing and expanding uh, the sink in Europe. Uh, we have listed the number of legislative initiatives that we want to review and I'll, I'll go through them, but I'll simply name them. But I think, and I hope you appreciate that a significant legislative effort is underway in Brussels to look at further strengthening the framework of climate energy and other policies to deliver change. One of the, them is, and I think that's the first one, to review the EU emission trading system, uh, with that to review the market stability reserve, and to look into not only strengthening the existing system, but potentially also to expand the use of emission trading, and we've listed buildings and the road transport sector as sectors where we want to look into to do so. Um, we want to change uh, and adapt the effort sharing regulation. This is where we have national targets outside of the emission trading system. Uh, they will need to be strengthened, but at the same time, the question is raised, if we would you know, increase the use of emission trading, should we then maintain the scope of the effort sharing regulation with its national targets, or should we shrink it uh, so that we have uh, well, exclusive systems as they are today? Uh, there will be initiatives on renewable energy, energy efficiency. There will be initiatives around energy performance of buildings, eco-design standards, CO2 and car standards. There will be new policies around sustainable fuels, notably focused also on shipping and aviation. Uh, there are the policies related to the deployment of infrastructure, and there both the Trans-European Networks Directive and the Alternative Inf Infrastructure Directive will be revisited. And as I indicated already, there will be a number of policies to, uh, well, basically look at how can we increase land use um, absorptions, and that's also linked to a number of agriculture and environmental policies such as the biodiversity strategy. Finally, uh, there is a whole basket of policies on the development related to finance, both on the side, and I'll come back to that briefly, how you as a, as a government can provide finance, but also how you can basically influence how markets look at, let's say, the risk of climate uh, intensive uh, or GAG intensive related assets. Finally, we will be revising the state aid guidelines, and that's quite important because we think for a number of technologies we will require incentives for governments and how to make sure that these incentives are as market compatible as possible. Um, coming back on uh, the element of finance by government, as you know, we are right now in, a, in the COVID crisis. And I think the COVID crisis has already led to uh, stimulus packages. But an important one in Europe is the development of uh, the recovery fund. 
the recovery fund together with the EU budget in principle has over 1.8 trillion euro to spend in the next 10 years of which the recovery fund will actually do so in the early part of that period. And there is a clear desire uh, to make sure that uh, there is a high, uh, let's say, share of these funds going to climate related purposes. So we are looking at the moment at having 30% of them being climate relevant. Uh, that, of course, is also seen in the numbers. I think no surprise for you who does do the modeling, but at least we are estimating that compared to what we've spent in the last decade, we will have to spend in the coming decade around 350 billion euro a year more on uh, the energy transport and industrial complex to make it climate neutral. Now, at the same time, our numbers do indicate that that actually leads to only a very limited increase in total energy system costs because it is linked to significant fuel savings. And we've also looked, uh, and I'll be quite brief on that, but it relates to, of course, all your work. We've looked in quite some detail at the macroeconomic effects. And I think two interesting elements there, and I think it has to do with improvements over time of technology representations in modeling tools, but at least on our side, when we look at the macroeconomic impacts, I would say they're quite limited now. Uh, no significant impacts on, on GDP at the EU level. And, and that depends a little bit about, uh, I mean, basically at what kind of regulatory environment you, you try to represent in the model, we see even a slight positive impact potentially. Uh, and that relates notably to the use of uh, carbon uh, pricing. And as I said, we are looking at that also in the context of uh, incorporating the externalities in building and transport. And clearly you see there the economic effect of the good use of auctioning revenue potentially leading to positive outcomes. And similarly, in the modeling tools that basically assume that the market is not in equilibrium, also the investment boost related to uh, a climate plan can lead to overall uh, positive outcomes. And I think that is quite important. And it's also why we think this is actually a growth strategy. It will certainly also modernize the EU economy considerable. So finally, and that's my last uh, remark I want to say, I think for us, um, I think there has been a collective decision to, to go towards climate neutrality. I think this has kick-started in Europe a lot of a debate what that means. And I think that's quite interesting. And I think all our member states are having that reflection. Uh, we think that by strengthening the climate legislation for 2030, uh, we can provide for more of that business certainty, less risk of carbon lock-in. Uh, and as I said, we will have to link that to uh, the developments of, well, broad set of policies and actually in Europe, we refer to that as the European Green Deal. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, next up is uh, Jane K. Jun, who will be talking about net zero emissions targets in China. Um, and Jang, I don't know if you, yep, if you want to share slides, um, you may. If you don't want to, that's fine as well. And again, encourage the audience to post questions in the Q&A. Um, maybe we can work out the technical difficulties backstage and um, skip ahead to Joe, if that's okay. Uh, sure, I'd be happy to go ahead. And, uh, All right, thank you, Joe. And Jang, we'll come back to you, um, and hopefully we can get those worked out backstage. Great. Stephanie, do you see my slides? Uh, yes, I do. Fantastic. So uh, thank you, Stephanie, and thanks to the organizers of uh, the meetings. It's a real pleasure uh, to be with you here this morning if you're in the U.S. or afternoon or evening in other parts of the world. Uh, I've long been an avid consumer of the output of the integrated assessment modeling community. Uh, at risk of dating myself, it goes all the way back to the time of the Kyoto climate negotiations uh, when I was working in the U.S. government and we were drawing off a lot of the initial insights about what are the opportunities both for gains from trade uh, when we think about uh, the design of international climate policy, but also what long-term trajectories should look like uh, in order to stabilize the global climate. Uh, when I returned to government during the Obama administration, we again relied extensively on integrated assessment models, including uh, work that led to the U.S. government using uh, and developing a social cost of carbon to inform its evaluation of regulations. One thing I would like to stress here for, uh, before I get started with my remarks is to note that I did not work on uh, the Biden campaign. I'm not on the presidential transition team, so I'm not speaking on behalf of uh, the president-elect's team. Um, but I will note that in 2008, 2009, I did work on the presidential transition team and a lot of the issues we worked on then, how to design an economic stimulus that can make progress on climate change 
how to think about the kinds of policies to deliver on then President-elect Obama's goal to cut emissions 80% by the year 2050, provide, I think, some useful insights that we can draw from uh, for our assessment of what President-elect Biden and his team will be doing uh, once he's inaugurated in January. Um, so first, let me just uh, note the key elements of the Biden-Harris campaign platform and how it addressed climate change. I think it starts with the framing, as they note the title of this part of their campaign platform, which is that it's a, the Biden plan for a clean energy revolution and environmental justice. And so I think it's going to be important to think about this both in the context of what are the opportunities for decarbonization, but making sure that whatever policies, policies are undertaken to decarbonize the economy are ensuring that the benefits of that decarbonization are truly shared throughout the entire economy. The key goal, uh, the headline goal is to eventually reduce emissions on net to zero by the year 2050 and to have a 100% clean energy economy. As an interim goal, uh, the platform notes uh, the objective of a zero carbon power sector by 2035 and calls for $2 trillion in federal spending over the first four years. I'll note some of this could be on decarbonization. Some of this could also be focused on climate resilience, infrastructure investment to mitigate our exposure to future climate change shocks. So it may not be exclusively on decarbonization, but a significant uh, uh, call for federal spending for uh, the climate policy regime that President-elect Biden has called for. Now, when we think about these very ambitious goals, it's worth also considering though, the kinds of political constraints on policy. First is the challenge of how one transitions from campaigning to governing. And this is something we had to deal with 12 years ago. There are a lot of goals. And in fact, if one were to read the entire Biden uh, climate policy, clean energy platform, there's a lot of sector specific and even technology specific objectives in there. And one of the challenges that a campaign faces when they move from campaign to government is to try to think through what are the priorities. Some of these goals may have to be delayed, other, while others are championed first. And that may reflect a part of how one works with Congress, which I'll get to in a moment. It may reflect how you can take advantage of existing authorities. It may also just reflect the fundamentals of where we are right now in terms of both our economy and, and the way the government needs to address the state of the economy. There are some goals that may be delayed simply because we have to get COVID under control we have to uh, boost uh, economic output and create new jobs. Certainly there's a lot of opportunity to do that through clean energy investment. Um, but I think this is gonna be one of those things that the new Biden team will be wrestling with, which are what are the most important elements that they campaigned on that they have to continue to champion as they move forward in governing. The second constraint of course is working with Congress. No one believes that with the existing statutory authorities, you can get to a net zero economy by 2050. We will need new policy that's called for in the Biden plan. Some of that would require certainly spending, new, new legislation from Congress for the kinds of spending that President-elect Biden has called for. I'll get to the, some of the deep examples of that in the next slide. But some of that also will involve what will be the more of a comprehensive climate policy regime. Each of those is gonna require working with a Congress that is very closely divided. The House is a, has a very small majority for Democrats, President Biden's party. The Senate is still undecided. We have a special election in the state of Georgia in January to decide the final two Senate seats, which will determine whether or not Democrats or Republicans are gonna lead that chamber. Regardless of the outcome in Georgia though, we're gonna have a very closely divided Congress, which means it's gonna take a lot of political acumen in order to ensure that Biden can move his legislative agenda through Congress. The third uh, political constraint is what may be the role of judicial constraints on the executive branch using their existing statutory authorities to promulgate new regulations. We've uh, seen where in the wake of, of failure to move legislation in the Obama administration, an effort to use Clean Air Act regulatory authorities, regulatory authorities on fuel economy standards, on appliance efficiency standards, we're likely to see some more of that again, but there's a question in the, uh, whether the federal courts will provide the regulatory agencies enough discretion to really be ambitious in using those existing policy authorities to promulgate aggressive regulations to reduce emissions in uh, the way we produce power, move, our, uh, move around through vehicles, and, and how we consume electricity in our appliances. Now this, of course, I'll get to the suite of policy tools at their disposal. And I think this is important as we start to think about 
the uh, program necessary to deliver on these 2050 goals and some of this how it may inform your work in the modeling community on how you might evaluate them. It's to really understand sort of what I think are the three sort of categories, uh, major categories of policy tools that the Biden uh, administration will be looking to, to make initial progress on both that 2035 power sector decarbonization goal and the economy-wide decarbonization goal for 2050. Certainly in the near term, we can see interest in clean energy subsidies, continued tax credits for wind power, for solar power, perhaps tax credits for electric vehicles, tax credits for uh, the uh, investment in energy efficient equipment, uh, insulation, appliances, heating and cooling equipment, et cetera, in our buildings. This could be in a near term economic recovery program as a part of a stimulus package to try to rebuild uh, the US economy post COVID. Could also be part of an infrastructure package. Uh, legislation, there's been a lot of interest um, about uh, on both sides of the political aisle in the United States on the need to make investments in infrastructure. One might see a Biden administration work more uh, constructively and aggressively with Congress than what we've seen in the past administration on infrastructure. And clean energy investments may be a major component of an infrastructure legislation as well. But both these categories would focus on spending and subsidizing or helping having the government help underwrite the investment in clean energy technologies. The second major bucket would be how to think about economy-wide and long-term climate change legislation. There's been some interest of, uh, or in discussion about a national clean energy standard. We might think about this as a kind of tradable performance standard that's technology neutral across uh, the power sector, but it provides incentives for investment in low and zero carbon technologies. That tradable performance standard could ramp down over time and become more and more ambitious. That would help deliver on that 2035 power sector decarbonization goal. There's been some discussion about a carbon tax. Um, politically, this may be quite challenging. We have heard some conservative voices champion a carbon tax. I think the question is whether or not there's interest among Republicans in engaging constructively on either an, a clean energy standard, a carbon tax, or any other comprehensive long-term climate change policy program. The third approach would be for the Biden administration to work through existing regulatory authority. So they don't have to rely on cooperation with Congress, they can use the existing law under the Clean Air Act, existing energy laws that give them the authorities to improve fuel economy and appliance efficiency. They could go and try to promote uh, and, and uh, implement more ambitious standards for methane emissions, something that the Obama administration had undertaken, but were walked back by the Trump administration. They may also try to work with uh, independent financial regulators. The Treasury Department has the opportunity to convene all the financial regulators and try to push for serious consideration of climate change as a potential systemic risk to the financial system. This might take the form of financial disclosure for, uh, for major companies. It may uh, focus on banks' balance sheets to make sure that they can satisfy a kind of climate-oriented stress test. There's a variety of ways in which one can create more incentives, provide greater flow of information that may help uh, move more investment dollars towards uh, climate-oriented or clean energy spending in the private sector. Finally, I'll note uh, that we've seen in both the Obama administration, dating to the very end of the Bush administration, and then to some degree in the Trump administration, the use of the social cost of carbon that's relied on the outputs of integrated assessment models for evaluating regulations. Uh, and I think there's a question about how one might move forward with the social cost of carbon in the Biden administration, how it might be modified relative to the way the Trump administration uh, had implemented it, both in terms of what kind of perspective, domestic versus global, one thinks about the benefits, what kind of discount rates to apply, but also how to better integrate the latest scholarship about the damages of climate change to improve those damage functions in the integrated assessment models to provide those kinds of insights that can inform uh, the evaluation of regulatory proposals. I will note there are some who suggest that we shouldn't use a social cost of carbon, but instead think through what is a least cost path to getting to the zero carbon 2050 goal. And in that case, it's something that may be more similar to what we see, for example, in the UK, where they have a kind of carbon price that's based off of the least cost trajectory for meeting its emissions goals. And so I think there may be some debate about what may be the best way forward here, but it's interesting in either case, it's gonna be built on the evidence that's produced by the modeling community. Let me close with a couple of comments about how models can inform the policy challenge the Biden administration faces. 
First, and I will recognize this is very difficult in our modeling tools, whether we're talking about uh, the integrated assessment modeling community or even more generally in terms of how we apply economic tools to evaluate innovation. Innovation is clearly going to be critical when we think about the feasibility of a 2050 net zero goal. It's going to be feasible so long as we achieve key technological advances. I think there's ways we can use some of our modeling tools to understand how important it's going to be to make some of these advances. How important will it be to make advances in hydrogen or nuclear or storage or CCS to be able to deliver on these? We've seen some incredible improvements in technologies over the past couple of decades, say, such as in solar and wind. We've seen some recent improvements in the cost of storage, but we also have some not so promising stories. CCS hasn't progressed as quickly as many people had expected. Cellulose and ethanol has not uh, made as much progress as people thought as a way to deliver low carbon liquid fuels. So it'll be useful to think through how the innovation and in key technologies will dictate the cost and the feasibility of these ambitious 2050 goals. Second, I think it's important to think about competitiveness. A lot of our previous analysis have tried to look at what's the impact of implementing ambitious policies haven't been nearly as ambitious as what's going to be necessary to get to a 2050 zero carbon goal. So it may be useful to understand both the emission leakage and the competitiveness impacts of what would be effectively very high carbon prices to get to a 2050 net zero economy. Third, and I think this is reflected in the theme in the, uh, of the Biden campaign platform on climate, is to understand the distributional consequences and to make sure that we're not disproportionately harming any part of our economy or any population or community in our economy, or at least try to mitigate the extent to which they are harmed moving forward. Some of this can think about how we use the, uh, the value or the revenues generated from policy, how we can target those, say, to lower income households who may have a higher fraction of their budgets dedicated to energy consumption. We may think about the geographic spread here. And in fact, a lot of the concerns that come from the environmental justice community in the United States has been about their concerns that they will be continue to be exposed to high levels of conventional air pollutants if we rely on market-based approaches to reducing CO2 emissions. So there's ways I think we can take advantage of new uh, data and modeling tools to better understand at a finer spatial le level the nature of the exposure of, uh, of uh, local air pollutants that are correlated with our CO2 emissions. We may also understand better as we invest in clean energy uh, technologies who's benefiting from those uh, in, uh, as we move forward in the initial stages of the implementation strategy. I think a big issue here is going to be overlapping policies and how we try to model those is difficult, but it's going to be incredibly important because we are going to have a, a very, I think, mixed uh, set of policies, a complicated framework of policies that will be implemented uh, to try to deliver on a 2050 goal. Understanding the economic and environmental impacts of this overlapping suite of policies will be important. It'll be critical to identify where there may be counterproductive combinations to inform policymakers. It may also be useful to understand where there are effective contemporary mixes of policies, but also how we might want to think about sequencing policies over time. It may also be useful for us to think about ways we can calibrate our models for non-price policies that can draw up some of the recent research that's based on causal inference, uh, excuse me, causal inference, not casual inference, as my slide incorrectly notes, causal inference methods in order to evaluate the impacts of some of these non-price policies. Finally, let me note that we should be thinking about a decarbonization strategy that's part of a broader portfolio of efforts to mitigate the risks posed by climate change. And we're gonna see more and more, I think, concerted efforts to understand not just what we can do policy-wise to decarbonize, but also what we can do to facilitate the development and commercialization of direct air capture technologies. I think we're gonna see more and more focus on how to implement investments to facilitate adaptation, to mitigate the risk associated with any degree of warming and associated climate changes. And I think we're gonna have more and more serious policy discussion about solar radiation management and related techniques to try to offset the degree of warming for any uh, level of accumulated greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So I think the modeling community can help us better understand how the mix of approaches of mitigating climate change risk can be pursued, how they might be pursued in tandem, how they may be pursued sequentially, can all further inform the policy development uh, and implementation in the Biden administration and by other governments around the world. Uh, again, it's been a pleasure to join you this morning. and I look forward to our discussion uh, after the last presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, I think we are going to be able to go a few minutes longer um, for this session. So we have um, plenty of time for Jen K. June to present on the emissions targets in China and then still some time for Q&A.
So, Jang, if you want to, I don't know if you have slides to share or not. Yes, I have wanna... slides. Okay, that's great. I'm so happy to to talk with uh, colleagues here for the China's carbon neutrality target. And uh, actually, it's happened <laughs> in 70, uh, September 22nd. Uh, President Xi Jinping announced that China's CO2 emission will peak before 2030 and also will make efforts to be carbon neutrality before 2060. So it's a very big achievement for that because right now China is already almost ready to prepare our 14th five year plan because the draft will come uh, just in, in uh, less than one month and will be announced in next March in the Congress. So because this change is uh, so many of my colleagues still working on uh, to revise the, the 14th five year plan and uh, we only get very short timing for that one. That means so far we don't have very detailed uh, policy what to do with that one. Uh, just like what happened in EU, Tom present and also in US, you already have very long document to, to talk about with that one. So today we are still thinking about our possible future, what we can do with that one. Because right now, our main ideas uh, right now, EU, China, Canada, China, Japan, Korea, South Africa, and the US, I think coming soon, will have the carbon neutrality uh, target for 2050 in China before 2060. But I think it's quite consistent with other countries. And uh, this meaning for China, we, we try to understand this is a uh, a way to change our future. And uh, China should play our role in the coming uh, years to think about what's the future uh, uh, climate change issues. Because now they almost all the technology countries are targeting on the carbon neutral. And the companies are setting up the target for carbon neutral. I think we also propose more than 200 companies will announce a carbon neutrality target uh, before 2050. Uh, in the coming several years, and also 100 uh, cities to announce their carbon neutrality target. Uh, so that means that uh, if we can do like this way, that means almost all the countries will have a carbon neutral or carbon neutrality uh, in the coming futures. That's uh, the way we should work together. And uh, for last several years, actually, I'm so happy to join your, your, your guys, uh, for example, that love with many colleagues will work together with the city link, engage, commit, and uh, uh, many projects together. We present our results based on the studies. For example, we want uh, in 2017, we start to propose China's middle century strategy should cover two degree pathway and 1.5 degree pathways. Only important thing is uh, what's the transition for energy. Actually, this, uh, this figure we presented for two years. And uh, I think many Chinese colleagues who is working on energy already know about this one. So, so far, seems the energy planning for the 14th five-year plan is go ahead, go ahead like this way. And of course, we do need a lot of policy, but China is good at the common control policies. So we will continue to do with that one. Only issue is <laughs> if we really want to do carbon neutrality before 2060, but in our study, we say 2050 what happened in 2030 in order to match with the, the 1.5 degree target. This is something we remind for the modelers to work together much more because uh, anyway, it, it's also still possible for China to announce something new uh, in, in the coming future for 2030 target or even uh, more clear uh, idea for the carbon neutrality in China. And of course, we want to support not only for the carbon or climate change policies. China also work hardly with the air quality things. Uh, we're also talking about in the 2050 whether China's air quality can go ahead with uh, WHO standard. But uh, if we really want to go to WHO standard by 2050, that means emission from energy activities also will be nearly zero. So it's a quite match with the 1.5 degree pathway in, in China. Of course, SDGs, yes, uh, we did a lot together with the CityLink project colleagues and other projects. We are linking with the uh, uh, carbon neutrality uh, study with these uh, SDGs. And the most important thing, recent several months, we are talking about 
This is not only for energy transition, it's not only for the carbon neutrality by 2050 or before 2060. It's so important for China's economic transition or economic investment. We are go ahead with that. I think in the next 30 years, so many things in the economic activities will be changed. So this is the fundamental story right now we are talking about here in China. For example, what happened is still making ammonia, benzene, and ethylene, methanol, clinker, highway duty, transport, and airplane. This is totally new for many Chinese uh, companies. They don't understand what happened for that one, but we need to get the idea with them. And uh, hydrogen demand, what's the future of hydrogen? And also how the hydrogen future can impact China's economic distribution. Uh, maybe the economy will be reallocated based on the cheap renewable energy in China. So it's a totally different shape with the current economy zones. And the uh, good thing is that China move very fast with some, with some new technology. For example, this is a figure for uh, solar PV in 2012 and 2013. This is what happened last year. And right now, China is planning uh, for the 14th five-year plan. We can go ahead with uh, every year 100 gigawatt of solar PV and wind. But uh, due to the new announcement of the carbon neutrality in China, uh, colleagues here is, is, is thinking about to revise this target to be higher. And some other new technologies moving, electric car, electric vehicle, and uh, we get very good news in recent so weeks. They are so excited with the new target here in China. And also China have a very big overseas investment. So we also start to think about how to help other different countries uh, with the Chinese investment overseas. And this can tell the figure how big we can go ahead with that. Maybe by 2030, the total overseas investment in China could be higher than 400 billion US dollars. And one third of them go ahead with the carbon emission re related activities. Then we really want to go ahead together with the new target in China. And uh, finally, finally, just like what happened in EU, uh, they did, we have a higher GDP compared with the baseline two degree scenario. So that means uh, we can find some way to make our GDP better. Uh, this is similar with that in the EU and the US. Okay, thank you very much. I'll finish here. Uh, I will listen to your comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jen Kajun. Um, so um, I, I think that maybe Tom is disconnected for the moment. So we can, um, I'll start with questions for Joe and others. Please enter your questions in the Q&A. Um, we do have a few extra minutes. So there, there should be plenty of extra, or plenty of time for um, discussion. Um, first question for Joe. Uh, do you think the partisanship in the U.S. climate debate will increase, decrease, stay about the same for the next four years? There's a lot of questions here, actually. <laughs> uh, how will the position of big Republican donors like the Kochs evolve? Will the Republican strategy be to win 2024 on a Trump-like ticket after four years of gridlock, or will they move toward governing? So I guess you can take your pick on that. There was a long list of questions there. So I, I think we're in a high variance environment when we think about what might be the evolution of politics and partisanship, especially with respect to climate change uh, in the US. So, so part of this, I think, going to depend on how a Biden administration is able to work or not with Congress over the next, I would say, three to 12 months. Uh, if, if we're able to see some kind of constructive efforts um, you know, I, th I think there are some in both parties actually would like to get back to the business of writing laws and, and promoting new policies on a variety of fronts in Congress. Uh, so I think if you can build a kind of constructive dynamic uh, and one where you have, I think, a, a credible, thoughtful and engaged executive branch on that, uh, I think that would be very helpful. Um, so, so we'll just sort of, I think part of it is we're, we're, we'll have a better sense of how to answer this question, I think, as we move into 2021 and gain a little bit of experience about whether or not there's any uh, sort of credible good faith effort on both sides uh, to try to work together. There, there are a couple of things that I think are, 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 are changing. Uh, I think the influence of coal uh, as, as a lobbying influence on the right has diminished, uh, just as, as the coal industry has continued to decline even throughout the Trump years. 
I also think we're starting to see more and more of the major players in the oil and gas industry thinking about a future that is more broadly defined as an energy supplier and not just oil and gas and thinking about what they can do to reduce their emissions and reduce the emissions of supplying energy services throughout the economy. And I think that's going to influence how some of those on the right might engage on climate. At the end of the day, the question is going to be, does taking a position pro or con on climate change have any meaningful impact on your uh, political futures? And I think part of it is that for many Many members of Congress, many senators, not supporting climate change hasn't really hurt them much politically. In fact, in some cases, it's helped them to challenge any meaningful efforts on climate change. And, and so I think that's going to be the real question is whether or not we see an evolution in our politics and whether or not the cost of either ignoring the issue or dismissing it actively uh, are going to be higher now as, uh, as people are, are, I think, getting more engaged on the issue. We're so, certainly seeing it among younger adults in the U.S. getting more engaged on the issue. The question is how that translates into the, the political process. And, and I would just say, let's let's wait and see. That was a long non-answer, Stephanie. I apologize. No, it was it was a good answer. I, I think it's complicated. Um, <laughs> it, it looks like it's turned Tom on his side. Yes, um, Tom is back, which is great. Um, I'm just going to request real quick again that the audience not use the thumbs up button on the Q&A because it makes the questions bounce around for me and I can't follow them very well. Um, next question for Jang, I think there were actually a couple of questions on this topic. Um, your results showed higher GDP. Does this include avoided climate impacts or co-benefits of emissions or both? Or, you know, and just generally, what are the key drivers for that increase in GDP? Yes, uh, our paper is uh, already nearly to be published. The media driving force for that one is uh, first, lower energy price due to the uh, lower uh, energy from renewable energy and nuclear in China we could be very cheaper in, in, in the coming future, if especially, especially in the scenario for the 1.5 degree pathways. The second point is that China can reduce the import. Uh, this part is similar with the EU's result. And number three is uh, actually the productivity because the technology changing, the productivity change increased. Uh, so, and this is the major driving force for the model to show higher GDP in the carbon neutrality scenarios in China. And later we can send new papers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jen. Um, and one for Tom. Um, do you expect the EU HOS will be able to solve the issue of the 2030 target in the next council me meeting? And the second question on that, um, what international energy import strategies do you see for the EU until 2030? Okay. Um, do you hear me? Yes, okay, because yes, it's very do. strange. I, I hear you, Stephanie. I don't hear Joe. So it's, I don't know what's happening. I, I also see that I'm... Uh, <clears throat> Not vertically. Uh, well, anyway, you see me in a strange way, and and yeah, I have I logged in, I logged out, so I apologize. It's a bit of a of a mess, and I I can't change it. So okay, um, the question on the heads of state is an interesting one. Um, I am hopeful. Yes, uh, is it all a done deal? No, I think they are discussing this. I think an important element is the recognition that it will require uh, an appropriate enabling framework. So I think that in Europe is, is is the language to say, okay, it has to be fair and we need to make sure that um, the efforts across sectors, across member states are done in a way that, well, in a way it's cost efficient and in a way it addresses fairness. And I think we see that in our uh, policy setup, you know, an ETS is in inherently a system that drives cost efficiency, but we can work with, for instance, how auctioning is distributed uh, to uh, address elements of fairness. And the same we see in the effort sharing regulation, where we, um, at the moment, require certain member states to take more action than others represented by their target, taking into account capacities. But then if you implement it, you do allow for flexibility across member states and even across sectors, because the linkage is, uh, for instance, with the land use sector and the, and the ETS there. Uh, I think it's going to be the recognition of that appropriate framework uh, that I think uh, hopefully will allow, um, yeah, the balanced language needed to to accept the target. Why am I hopeful? 
uh, it is not, I think, that we have a strong discussion right now taking into doubt the need for increased climate ambition. And I think that's not unimportant. I mean, the, the political realization that if you want to achieve a net zero GHG by 2050, that it needs yeah, basically a pathway that is, that is gradual but ambitious early on uh, is there. And I think that is the positive thing. So let's see where we will be next week. I'm hopeful, but indeed, this is not yet finalized. Uh, the question on import strategies, I think that can take many dimensions. I think in the EU, a key deliverable for the energy union is still energy security. Uh, and uh, we will not be off, let's say, all types of fuels that we import today, and that's notably, of course, fossil fuels, uh, by 2030. It's still a significant part of our energy mix will be uh, containing that. And I think there, uh, the strategy will remain the same, that we will need to make sure that we have a diversified import uh, portfolio, allowing us to make sure that we have energy security. Nevertheless, and I think these data are, are there, um, if we go towards 55%, uh, we do see a reduction of imports of fossil fuels uh, that is starting to get considerable already. And that, of course, will continue over time towards 2050. I think an additional element of discussion in Europe is actually also the discussion on uh, if we, but okay, I think this is a discussion that will develop over time. It's not one that has to be answered all today. But if we will see alternative fuels becoming more important in the EU, think about hydrogen, uh, where does it come from? And at the moment, it's true that in our assessment, we are still looking at, okay, maybe in a, in a simplified way of producing these goods, I mean, these alternative fuels domestically. And I think there is a policy discussion in Europe ongoing on, okay, how does that relate to imports and how can we over time yeah, see also there that part of that may be supplied domestically uh, or produced and part of that may come uh, from imports. And I think that is a policy domain under development, but okay, the truth is also that by 2030, we do see the need to have, you know, the first deployment of these technologies and to prove them at scale. But yeah, they're not yet a dominant energy compartment. So yeah, I think this will be something that will develop over time. Thank you, Tom. Um, then we have a question for all the panelists. Um, and I think if we um, each take, if you each take a minute or so, then that'll probably bring us to the, the end. But you can reply to questions. People can continue to ask questions and come back and see the replies after the session is over. Um, so the question is, how likely is it for international collaboration on technology and common international finance, given the current dynamic, dynamical geopolitics at the moment? Can you repeat the question, Stephanie? I apologize. Oh, oh sure. Um, no, that's okay. How likely is it for international collaboration on technology and common international finance, given the current dynamical geopolitics at the moment? Okay. Um, look, I think uh, on the side of, of, of both technology, um, yeah, technology transfer or collaboration and finance, I think at the side of the EU, we are aware that this will well, be something that we will need to continue to engage in. I don't think that stops uh, at a certain point. I mean, in the Paris Agreement, there are actually language on the need to continue that. And as I can understand from my colleagues, who are part of the negotiations, we will continue to engage in that in a constructive manner. Uh, I think it always comes to the discussions from a long time, okay, is it only that or, you know, do we need an enabling environment everywhere? And there, I would say that is also key, I think, the need in all regions in the world to develop the kind of, of policies that uh, allow also for uh, all actors to engage in that kind of transfer. And, and, and there, I, I would say, there is still the need, you know, I think for these discussions on, okay, where are we on NDC implementation? How can we improve that? How can we develop the capacity to make sure everybody can further update and improve their NDCs? So, okay, I think that is a, a continued engagement we have uh, at the international level where indeed capacity building is key. Thanks, Tom. Joe or Jen? Sure. Sure. Uh, so uh, I, I think we, we're likely to see a Biden administration uh, reverse uh, the efforts by the Trump administration 
first and foremost in rejoining the Paris Agreement, but also I think to get much more serious about how we use uh, both bilateral aid and multilateral institutions uh, to deliver international climate finance. And, and I think we're also likely not just to see them increase the, the resources available through both those channels, but also think about ways uh, to leverage more private sector finance in uh, the clean energy and climate space. It, it is a very different space today, though, globally than what it was when we really started having in a serious way these conversations, I think, in the lead up to the 2009 Copenhagen Conference, uh, where we really had for the first time global goals quantified on international climate finance. Uh, for example, I think China has become, and I, I'm curious to hear what, what Jung Kim Jun has to say on this, China has become much more active in how it is looking at export finance, how it is supporting the investment in energy technologies in other countries. Uh, so I think it's, there's there's a um, there's a richer need uh, a need for a richer conversation now. It's not just a small set of OECD countries, um, but it really is something that, for example, could be a subject of conversation among the G20, um, where we're really engaging those largest economies in both the developed and the developing world that are provided uh, finance uh, to promote investment in energy technologies around the world, and think about ways we do that in, uh, in a manner that's better aligned or more aligned with our long term climate objectives. Um, I think one thing that's important to echo what Tom said about the NDCs, my guess is, is that you would see in a Biden administration sort of a continue, continuation of the approach of the Obama administration, which was, we will be more aggressive on mitigation, um, and uh, but we also need to see other countries become more aggressive on mitigation, and we want to see, uh, uh, in return for that, we're able to do more international climate finance. So I think as a Biden administration moves forward, figures out what its NDC is going to be, if they lay out a, an aggressive, incredible NDC, I think they'll use that then as a basis for making sure that other countries are doing more to enhance and update their NDC. I think the Biden team knows there's a credibility issue here, and so they're going to do everything they can to make those uh, make, make that proposal credible. But I think that's going to be something that they, they're going to think about working in tandem, both the enhancing of NDCs and the enhancing of international climate finance as we move forward with the implementation of the Paris framework. Joe, um, Bang, did you want to answer that as well? Yes. Okay. Uh, I think that the collaboration on the technology is so crucial for for the technology leading countries. Just like what happened in solar PV, we're getting it's much cheaper now. That means uh, maybe several years ago we negotiated for the 100 billion US dollar, and uh, could be easier for today because it's uh, much cheaper for solar PV and wind. And the US is now working harder on the advanced the nuclear generators uh, in, in Europe uh, for the very good technology for hydrogen based uh, industry and also transport. So I think that it's really crucial we should work together to make the cheap zero carbon emission technology available globally then make sure that uh, together we can go ahead with the 1.5 degree target. And uh, the financing issues should be much easier compared with before. That's from my side, I, I, I really want to talk. Thank, thank you, you all. Very, oh, thank you all very much. Thanks as our panelists and the audience. Um, and thank you to Detlef for letting us run a little over um, so we could have this discussion. Um, and people can continue to ask questions in the Q&A if they want, and our presenters can um, respond to them uh, offline. Thanks very much. We move now to the next session where we have uh, reporting back on the IMC and the scientific working groups. So John, by now you should be able to come on the stage, yes? I'm here, can you see me? Yeah, we can see you perfectly. Great. Okay, uh, since we had some uh, audio problems on Monday, uh, uh, none of you were able to hear my uh, normal uh, summary comments on the uh, state of the consortium. I can report that my dog thought I was truly brilliant at that, uh, at that time. Uh, in order to catch up a little bit on that and also uh, tilt it in a way uh, that introduces the progress reports uh, that are the main part of this session uh, from the scientific uh, working group, 
I will uh, go through just a few of the slides that uh, I would have shown on uh, on Tuesday. So, Detlef, next slide. So, uh, just to remind you, uh, the the purpose and aims of the IMC are uh, what what I think of as uh, communication command and control, bar borrowing from the national security. A community with a heavy dose more on the communication and even coordination side. So there's three parts to that. One is internally within the community, which has grown as we've seen quite uh, dramatically uh, the last uh, 10 or 15 years, uh, to, but also to facilitate uh, interactions and collaborations with other scientific communities and with other government and intergovernmental governmental agencies. Next slide. This has been a uh, active year, particularly for our uh, very excellent uh, secretariat that's only uh, two or three years on the job, led by Monica Eberle and Celia Bertoline uh, from CMCC. Uh, this year in particular, even prior to COVID and all the adjustments that required, uh, they had or organized and implemented alongside the uh, key members of the community a major website upgrade. If you haven't checked it out, I urge you to do so and developed a modern, uh, with some of us old timers kicking and screaming at times, uh, communication strategy, including, uh, including video pills, the Scenario Explorer, and uh, my own personal favorite now, uh, social media through Twitter and, uh, and the like. Uh, they also had the challenge uh, of organizing the annual meeting for the first time in 13 uh, completely online. So this is the 13th annual meeting. In addition, the uh, community continues. I can't even go through the summary of the list. A number of cooperative, uh, cooperative agreements with the IPCC work groups, uh, the ASA, uh, et cetera. Uh, some of the more recent uh, financial institution requests have been uh, quite uh, uh, interesting and important to deal with. Uh, uh, we've also, with the help of uh, primarily of our friends from the ASA, where most of the integrated assessment model uh, results are stored, uh, uh, provided a, a very uh, essential uh, public good in terms of uh, storing all the data that's produced by the, almost all the data produced by the integrated assessment community. Next slide. So uh, just a snapshot of the progress. This is actually from the I, uh, IMC website, the new one. Uh, we now have 61 uh, IMC members. Now remember, these are not individuals. These are institutions. So think of them as 61 large uh, international uh, bombing centers spread around the world. Uh, 26 uh, countries are represented. Uh, 929 people uh, signed up to be part of the IMC network. Uh, we've already had 12 and now soon in an hour or so completed uh, 13 meetings. I would say on the recruiting side, uh, thanks to Roberto Schaefer, um, we've now expanded from one member of Brazil in Latin America to about half a dozen. We are working actively on, uh, on Africa right now for any of the, you who have ideas about African members. I think technically we have none. We have one in Saudi, uh, in uh, Russia and none in the uh, Middle East right now. So we're actively uh, recruiting to expand the uh, network. Next slide. So structurally, just to remind you, uh, we have a scientific steering committee, which is uh, composed of representatives of 14 of the 61 member uh, organizations. Uh, they do mostly uh, coordination and uh, communication activities with a little bit of uh, command and control, I would say. The uh, beating heart of the uh, uh, consortium is the scientific working groups, of which there are now four. Well, I'll hear reports of them in just a minute. Uh, we do now have uh, stood up a active uh, uh, advisory council. We've talked about that for a number of years, and now we have a a, 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 a serious start on that in, involving uh, some people you've already heard from uh, today. Uh, so I'd like to focus my final couple of slides on uh, the advisory council and who's on it currently and on the scientific working groups. 
So we now have nine people. Uh, our plan calls for getting up to 15, which we hope to accomplish in 2021. You'll see there are three uh, the th three co-chairs from the uh, current co-chairs from the uh, IPCC, Tom Van Ireland from the um, DG Klima in uh, Europe. You just heard from Alan Fawcett from EPA in the US, uh, Dirk uh, Vesner from the Environment Agency of Germany, uh, from the International Organization Laura, or, Organization uh, side, Laura Cosi from the International Energy Agency and from the NGO side, uh, a, a friend of us all in the integrated assessment community, Sarabi Menon from Climate Works. Uh, Foundation. So, uh, and then finally, uh, last but not least, Xiao Dadi, a uh, mentor of John Kajun, among many other things, who's very influential in uh, climate and broader political circles in uh, China. So, next slide. So that brings us conveniently to uh, the identification of the four active scientific working groups uh, by way of introduction to brief updates from them uh, uh, immediately following. Uh, so as I understand it in the um, uh, list of uh, presenters on the data protocols and management, Volker Cray and Kate Calvin will talk on the evaluation and diagnostics, the team listed uh, has uh, convinced uh, Matthias Harmson to talk about a IMC uh, collaborative diagnostic uh, project that's going on. Kaylin Riahi will talk about the scenario scientific work, the progress of this scenario scientific working group, and uh, Elmar Kriegler on the newest of the four, the scientific working group on scenarios for climate-related financial assessment. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to um, Volker and Kate to talk about the progress of the uh, working group on data protocols and management. To give an update on the licensing of I <laughs> scenario data sets. Um, uh, so there's a lot of requests for using these for commercial use, which isn't covered by all licenses. You want to go to the next slide, and then we can come back. If Volker's, yeah, okay. Um, so um, one of the things that we want to talk about. This isn't a current activity, but it's related to some of the current activities, both in the data scientific working group and in other working groups, is about increasing transparency of IAMs. Um, so there's been a lot of papers about this in the last couple of years, um, and with some suggestions and some criticisms, and we thought maybe it would be a good place to discuss how to address some of these. And so I'm showing a figure from a recent paper by Butner and colleagues that are looking at how transparent IAMs are about X assumptions, and what they did there was only go through publicly available documentation and papers and try to figure out not just what is represented in a model, but how, and then they assessed how transparent they are. And what they found was no model was completely transparent. Some were better than others at certain things. Um, in some aspects, we're, we're doing a better job of than others. And then there's another couple of papers that have made some suggestions on how to be more transparent. Those suggestions include things like open source, including code and input data sets, um, easy to access model inputs and assumptions, sensitivity analysis and model diagnostics, and interdisciplinary engagement. Um, and there's a there's a long list of them in, in one of the publications I've mentioned here. Um, and so some of the ideas we've sort of just started thinking about for the IAMC and these need a lot of discussion and potentially some coordination across working groups. Um, first is better reporting of input data in IAM databases. So a lot of uh, users of IAM results complain that they can't figure out what the inputs are and how they're driving the results. Um, I think providing all the input data wouldn't necessarily address all of this, but it's a step in that direction, and so trying to increase reporting there. Um, consolidated assumptions from across NIP papers. There have been a lot of papers that have been published lately, particularly I'm thinking about the EMF 33, where they have these really nice tables of assumptions of cross models for different aspects, and it might be nice to sort of move all of that information into the IAMC wiki on documentation just so it's all in one place so people aren't hunting around with a lot of papers. We've done a lot of work at collecting this information, but it's not easy to access for other people. Um, this last idea, so this is coming up from these, is a standard set of sensitivities routinely run, like something for DEC. This is something that I think the Diagnostic and Evaluation Group have been talking about, and I know there's some work under Navigate to do that. So from a data protocols place, 
um, position would be more about how to facilitate making that available and how to you know help with those results. Um, again, these are just some initial ideas. I don't think this criticism about transparency is going to go away, and so I think we should start to think about how we can improve here. So I propose to go to the next working group. Okay, I think that's Matthias. Is that correct? Hello. Matthias, can you yeah. press the green I did. telephone? Can you hear me? We can hear you perfectly. Okay, perfect. It's uh, very much, just give me one second. Then, um, yeah, this fits very well with the last presentation. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to say something about uh, model documentation and uh, diagnostics. Um, you should now see uh, a snapshot of the uh, IMC model documentation website hosted by PBL, AKA the IMC Wiki. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of work uh, done this year on that. So now also in close collaboration with uh, the IMC Secretariat, we now have, um, I would say almost all uh, IAMs from, uh, or not all, but most of them um, on the Wiki. Uh, at least uh, most have an overview page and uh, many also have uh, more elaborate, more documentation. Uh, we also provide overviews that can be used in an IPC assessment report, so for AR6. And yeah, we did a few sessions this year for people to uh, be able to uh, edit themselves on the Wiki. So, uh, and we'll continue to do that next year. So then on the diagnostics, which is closely related and uh, yeah, hopefully answers to offers maybe the idea that uh, Kate just presented. Uh, yes, well, why uh, do we do we want to do this? I think for obvious reasons, uh, we want to classify models based on their behavior and also try at least to understand reasons for differences between models uh, to ultimately also understand why they show certain behavior in studies, for instance, and that uh, leads to more transparency, obviously. Um, but how uh, do we do that? Um, by assessing model responses in the form of indicators in simple stylized scenarios that has been done before, um, also in Ampere, of course. Um, but uh, yeah, for this, what I'll show you, uh, we made use of results in Advance and Navigate and combined results from different model versions. Um, and yeah, you can think of an analogy to how climate models are diagnosed. There, there's also a set of standard indicators uh, like climate sensitivity or uh, transient climate response. Um, and these are following set rules, uh, but in, are in principle arbitrary numbers. And you don't need to have an exact, the, the, a certain value, but you just want to know which models are cool or hot, for instance, in that case, or uh, slowly or fast uh, responding or sensitive to carbon emissions. And basically, we're doing the same, but that's uh, feeding carbon emissions, but feeding, um, yeah, in, in the most scenarios, a carbon tax. So an incentive for climate policy. Uh, now, the here you see, I think, I hope, the um, uh, list of indicators. Uh, this is based and revisiting, uh, based on and revisiting uh, Krieke et al. paper from Ampere. Uh, and there we made a few additions and changes to the uh, to the indicators that were uh, this were used there. Um, basically, one thing is that we also made it a bit more simple and standardized in the sense that it can also be used in future uh, studies. And indeed, as mentioned before, um, hopefully as, as a sort of standard test that you can always do and easily do also. And in this list, uh, arguably maybe the most important one is the relative abatement in index, the first one. So just uh, basically uh, percentage abatement compared to baseline. Uh, the second one, uh, emission reduction type, is uh, measures to which degree, are, how are these uh, reductions realized, either via supply or demand side emissions or emission reductions. Uh, transformation index uh, measures the overall transformation speed in the energy system. Uh, fossil fuel reduction also uh, relates to transformation, simply uh, how much fossil fuels reduce compared to the present day. Inertia time scale is how fast do, does a model respond to a big shock. Um, so we measure, we, we compare a shock scenario and a default scenario and basically uh, look at how, how fast these converge. 
Last one is a measure, a cost per abatement value is a measure for the policy costs. Um, yeah, basically high value just says, says that the um, yeah, cost, policy costs are generally high. Uh, and all these indicators are, are not only used to classify models, but also to track uh, progress, as I'll show in the next slide. Um, here for this slide is just an example. Um, my last, last slide uh, of the rel relative abatement index. Um, you see the, the carbon tax, which is a uh, preset uh, exponentially growing carbon price over the century, and then it leads to uh, reductions, of course, of emissions. Um, and then there was a line, but for 2050, uh, we measure those reductions, as we do also for the other indicators. And that's uh, formulated as 30 years after the introduction of the tax, so it can also be used in future studies. And then you see uh, the results. Um, just a snapshot, just to give you an idea. Um, on the X uh, axis, you see the reduction. Um, and then on the Y are the mo models, and we group them by type. And a few things I can just say here might be interesting. First of all, uh, there's a huge <laughs> spread in the models, so that's very useful also to know if you look at studies, knowing that the model is, is pretty low here or high. Uh, what you also see is that the stars are the most recent model versions and that are in, in many cases also a big difference between an older and a newer version. Uh, so those kind of things do uh, are also highlighted in a paper that we're working on and should be part of AR6. And we particularly also want to understand where the di these differences come from. Um, yeah, so that's it for now, I think. Thank you. So um, the mission uh, of this SWG is to look into the potential use and development of scenarios from integrated assessment models for the finance sector, for financial risk assessment, but also to think about how to better in integrate and include and account for the finance sector in integrated assessment modeling and we do this uh, by recognizing that the finance sector has a lot of different actors from regulators and central banks to private actors, insurers, as asset managers. Um, the group has a number of activities that it's uh, planning to do, exchange information among IMC members of what they are doing uh, uh, with the finance sector, facilitate the dialogue with <clears throat> um, within the IM community on advancing the, the, the science um, of, of trying to integrate the finance sector into IAM and also facilitating the dialogue with the um, finance community um, as needed. So let's move to the next slide. And maybe I'm having a delay here, so I'm looking at these slides and already continue, continue talking. So the uh, SWG, SWG currently has uh, about uh, 27 members from 15 institutions. It's of course open to all members of the IMC. If you're interested to join, uh, shoot an email to Jay and, and me. Um, we conducted several conference calls and exchange information in 2019. Uh, one big point was to formulate our mission statement, and identify a list of discussion points uh, because we were newly formed in 2019. And now for 2020, I have to openly admit, we went into a COVID freeze. So there was not uh, uh, much conversation going on within the uh, SWG, but there were a number of activities by IMC members with the finance uh, sector in this, uh, in this year. So maybe you can move to the next slide. Um, right. So yeah, here we go. And I'm just listing three. I, we should complete this list um, after this, this meeting. So um, if you as members have additional activities of the finance, uh, uh, with the finance community in this year, please send this as an email to Jay and myself, and then we can uh, add to this list of examples on this slide. But let me name those three here. So there is a project right now going on on developing climate change scenarios for financial risk assessment uh, for the network of greening the financial system. So that's a network of central banks and, and financial supervisors. Um, and first uh, release of scenarios happened in um, June 
2020. You can follow this link and see the type of scenarios and the documentation. And currently the work is uh, for 2021 to, to have a second release of updated scenarios. Um, there was collaboration with the UNEP Finance Initiative banking pilot. It was already the second phase. So we participated also in the first phase. Uh, also a report published in October. Uh, you find the link there. This was focused on transition risk. Uh, and uh, finally, APRI did a study um, uh, reviewing the 1.5 degree scenarios and what actually can be learned from those uh, for company um, and financial climate transition risk assessment. Um, so here's another link. So uh, members have been quite active during this time. Only the SWG has been a bit uh, on the back burner during the COVID time. Thank you. So thank you, Elmar. Great. The, uh, thank you very much uh, for those excellent uh, updates. And uh, for all of you in the audience, please contact the coordinators of the scientific working groups if you want to get involved. I do think they're all doing uh, extremely important and uh, exciting work, uh, particularly as laid out by the previous panel in this uh, time of great change, but perhaps great opportunity on the uh, US side, I might add. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Detlev and Buren to chair the final session of this year's meeting on awards. Detlev? So we go to the final session and uh, it's an important session because it's about the announcements of the awards of this year. And we will announce the best poster uh, of this year. Uh, we also will announce uh, the IMC award for the extraordinary contribution to the field of integrated assessment modeling. Um, so first of all, uh, the best poster award. Um, uh, for this, we had a, a committee of people that have uh, looked at the posters. And in previous years, we had three criteria to look at. Uh, effectiveness of the poster in communicating research findings, motivation and methods, and scientific merit in uh, originality of the research. And we also looked at how the presenter was actually presenting the poster. Uh, this year, um, it turned out a bit more time consuming to see all the posters. So uh, we have concentrated a little bit more on the PDFs and the posters as they were and see whether they were already communicated uh, themselves. And based on that, we have selected two posters actually because they came out ex equal. And these are the poster uh, with the first author, Jerome Hilaire, uh, Risk Factor Pathways Translating Climate Scenario Data into Useful Metrics for Financial Risk Analysis. And a second poster, by Siddharth Joshi, a high resolution assessment of global rooftop solar PV technical and economic potential using big data and machine learning. And I will explain, here are the two posters, uh, why we have chosen these two. So on the first poster, we we felt that it was really nicely communicated, the work that was done, and as well as the results. But we also really appreciated the type of work that was done and uh, making uh, information from the IM community available for uh, uh, another sector, uh, which is the finance sector. And um, we, we really felt it was innovative work uh, in integrated assessment and therefore have uh, chosen this poster. At the same time, there was a second poster that we really liked, uh, which was uh, the, place, the poster by uh, Siddharth Yushi. And we appreciated that a lot because of two reasons. First of all, uh, IEM models clearly depend on data. And so it is an important uh, action of our com community to also make sure that there's data available for the community to use. Uh, and so we found it interesting to highlight the data exercise. Secondly, in terms of methods, we found that this work really innovative uh, using uh, big data and machine learning. And probably it's a way, uh, direction that all of us are already going or uh, might be going in the future. So clearly these were two uh, really nice posters and we will make sure that we send uh, the award for the best poster to both uh, presenters. And I would like to applaud them. Yeah, that's a bit odd that uh, compared to other years, we can't invite uh, the presenter up to the podium. 
uh, nor can we just do an, uh, a round of applause, so I have to do it on my own. But um, now I would like to go to the IMC Award for Extraordinary Contributions to the Field of Integrated Assessment Modeling. Um, and here, the winner is something that is extremely popular in the field of, uh, uh, of integrated assessment. And how do we know it? Now, for, for a starter, he was actually nominated the, uh, multiple times, and not only by his own team, uh, but also by multiple teams. And so popularity is not a criteria for to decide who wins the prize, but it was interesting to note. And partly this is probably because of his great sense of humor. But as I said, these are not criteria to, for winning the prize. And so I now will turn to who was selected. It's Roberto Schaefer, uh, who receives this year's IMC Award for Extraordinary Contributions in the Field of Integrated Assessment Modeling. And now I need to take a little time to see whether I can get uh, Roberto to, to, to join me on stage. So first of all, congratulations. And uh, I would like to explain why we gave this uh, uh, award to you this year and uh, to everybody. So first of all, uh, Roberto Schaefer has played a key role in developing IEMs at the Copy Institute. And the team is now actually among the leading teams worldwide. And uh, you can already see also the humor here uh, with the Copy Institute. Uh, they developed the Copy Coffee and the Copy Tea model, uh, which are now uh, well-established models. But that's not only a thing and uh, why we would concentrate on the uh, giving the prize this year, but uh, because this year, uh, Roberto has also significantly contributed to the IM community. And I would really like to highlight the, his role as a uh, convening lead author in chapter three of the IPC sixth assessment report. This is the long-term scenario chapter of the new IPC report. And that's where a lot of IM work finds its place. And then also, especially this year, Roberto is playing a major role in providing a link between global IMs and national IM analysis. And um, that's part of, for instance, in the past, the CD Links project, it's, uh, but also the Commit project. And um, Robert Roberto has been leading several papers this year where national analysis is presented in the context of global uh, goals. And as part of this, um, his work is also promoting IEM use in major developing countries, which we really would like to highlight. Yeah, and specifically talking about uh, uh, expanding IEM use, uh, the thing that we also would like to highlight is the work that Roberto has been doing in uh, expanding integrated assessment modeling specific specifically in Latin America and um, helping other teams in Latin America to start growing. And that is obviously also something that we want to do as IMC going beyond the uh, Europe and US uh, rich, rich origins of our field. Uh, clearly, we have a lot of teams already in Asia, uh, but Latin America and hopefully in the future also Africa would be places where we would like to see teams as well. So again, Roberto, um, uh, congratulations. And maybe you would like to add something. Well, thank you very much. I'm really taken by surprise with this. Many people thought that 2020 was a year to forget, but for me it's gonna be a year to, to remember forever. And my first reaction, my first word, let's say, is basically to thank you very much for this recognition. But uh, let's say, I have to be very honest here. I can think of at least, I don't know, 10 or 20 people in this group, probably in this virtual room today, that would deserve this award as much as I do. So I really have to, to thank you very much for that. And let's say, if I try to make a parallel with a kind of Oscar awarding ceremony, I can think, let's say, many more people are disappointed by not receiving the award that perhaps are happy to receive the award. But perhaps this is not the case here today, because I can also think about a large group of people that are very happy with this recognition. And basically, these are the people from my group at Copy. 
These are my master's students, my PG students, my postdocs, my colleague professors. And I'm being very honest here. I really think that this uh, award belong, belongs much more to them than really to me. I say over these past 20 years, they were the ones that they have been working with me, let's say, to really build a strong group, which I think is being recognized now. But I have really have to thank also my friends from IASA, from PIC, from uh, CMCC, from PBL, from the Pacific Northwest Lab, that also over these past 10 or 20 years have been creating the opportunities for my researchers to spend some time in their institutions, to do some capacity building, and, and eventually now have a group that is becoming more mature over time. So again, I'm very, very happy, very honored with this. And I want to thank you all, let's say, on behalf of my group of Atwap. Thank you very much. Thanks. So now, uh, John, back to you. OK, thanks, Detlev. Uh, can you show the next slide as an intro? So uh, it is my great honor and privilege to be awarding a IMC Lifetime Achievement Award. As most of you know, this award has only been given a few times and is not given every year. Uh, I would say uh, in the selection committee, uh, we have some good uh, candidates, but a very quick consensus around a particular individual. Now, hopefully this will be a surprise only to this individual, uh, whereas I think our committee and the community at large probably will not be surprised with this year's award winner for a lifetime uh, achievement. Uh, he is uh, uh, James J. Edmonds, uh, though it's my great uh, honor to be uh, at both the scientific and a personal level to be presenting this award this year. As uh, Roberto said, it is an odd year, so I'll remember this now for two things, I guess, and three things, maybe Roberto's award, Jay's award, uh, the, the year of, uh, of COVID. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, many of you probably do know, uh, there is, I'll kind of reverse fields from the way uh, Detlev presented uh, Roberto's war, uh, award and start with the technical achievements, which I think are undeniably uh, world-class and consistent. Uh, it has made Jay uh, in the conversation, if not at the top of the list for the GOAT award, the greatest of all time in integrated assessment modeling, right up there uh, with people from other fields like Mozart, Rembrandt, and for sports fans, uh, Michael Jordan and LeBron uh, James. So uh, in our citation, there is the kind of substantive contributions He's been an essential part of the IM enterprise from the very beginning and is in, in many ways the living memory of IM research over the past 40 years. He's co-authored many path-breaking uh, studies. He's been in on all the uh, scenario, uh, community scenario exercises, all the IPCC uh, 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 assessment reports. He's played uh, uh, crucial roles and he's kind of pushed the frontiers of the integrated assessment research into uh, technology strategies, uh, international uh, coordination and collaboration, coalition uh, formation, energy, water, land nexus, uh, I think was alongside perhaps PBL, the first, uh, his group was the first group to seriously consider land use in a integrated IEM uh, framework. And then finally, most, and most importantly, he's been an avid and tireless uh, IAM community builder. In fact, you saw evidence of this several times in the immediately preceding uh, session, some on purpose, some by accident. And I think uh, we conclude our formal citation uh, with the, uh, I think, heartfelt and consensus view that without Jay Edmonds' contributions, the IAM discipline and the IAM community would not be nearly uh, where they are today. So thank you for that, Jay. That's kind of on the scientific side. I think a lot of us felt uh, that didn't go far enough and that there was a personal side uh, to this. So I uh, quickly in the last two or three weeks surveyed uh, Jay's close colleagues and friends, which uh, number uh, wound up numbering at least in the hundreds. And there was a strong uh, consensus of views about what it is that makes Jay uh, 
such a great uh, leader for our community, even beyond his uh, technical contributions to the literature and whatnot. Um, and what I heard uh, from many people, not just one or two, I could probably say all these things just on my personal, from my personal perspective. Jay is truly someone who makes everyone around him much better than they otherwise would be. I heard this over and over again. Part of the keys to his success, evidently, I heard from another set of people, is he emphasizes the power of we over the power of me and argues staunchly and consistently that you're more likely to succeed if you uh, do it as a group. I can quote my uh, one of my favorite philosophers, Coach John Wooden, UCLA uh, head basketball coach, who said, isn't it amazing what we can uh, contribute as a, as a group uh, if no one thinks that it's important to sort out in advance who's going to get credit for our successes. I think in our community, Jay is really the, the gold standard uh, for that a way of thinking and that way of being. Uh, many people observe that he is a fantastic mentor and he puts everyone around him in a position to succeed. Uh, he kind of embodies the, uh, the essence of the pop uh, song Heroes, where the storyline is, if you're looking for heroes, there's one inside of each and every one of you. And I think Jay, uh, by my way of thinking, uh, does that to uh, all of us, each and every one of us, including uh, most importantly me. Uh, next, he's been a great friend and colleague uh, uh, to us all, and he is a, a tremendous role model uh, for all of us, including me and uh, Detma, evidently. So I'd like to close. Uh, I have my own uh, remembrances, and I've been waiting for this opportunity to acknowledge Jay at a personal and scientific level since around 1995, I, I think. But I'd like to end with one last slide, uh, which is uh, Detlef Van Vuren's uh, remembrance of this, where he has a sharper memory uh, than me. And he remembers uh, when he was a young uh, researcher at uh, PBL on the image team. Of course, it was called REVM back at that point, not PBL, same institution, uh, where he remembered quite vividly for some of us uh, that he and a colleague, Boss Eichelt, who many of you know, uh, were the rising stars, uh, I would say, at uh, RVM PBL, but also in our uh, community. And in a, a performance review, the big boss of the institute said, "Okay, you guys, uh, what do you be? What do you want to be when you grow up?" By way of uh, mentoring them and uh, career planning, and Boss. Uh, said he would like to be a negotiator, and he's not yet a chief negotiator, but he is the head of the Dutch uh, Green Party and on his way, perhaps, to being uh, the climate minister. And on our own Detlev's uh, behalf, uh, he said he would like to be a leading uh, academic scientific researcher in the IVM, uh, IM community, and much more specifically and pointedly, uh, what he wanted to become was someone like Jay Edmond. So this is a uh, more or less direct quote from our own Detlev uh, uh, Van Buren. So on behalf of all of us, I'd like to thank Jay for his many contributions to our profession and to each and every one of us personally. So maybe uh, Detlev, you could have Jay uh, uh, come on and say a few words of, uh, of shock and uh, acceptance of this high award. Jay, I really have been waiting, uh, as you probably can imagine, since about 1995 to uh, do, even at a personal level, let alone a large uh, public institutional level, which is even better, uh, make this award to you at both the scientific and personal level, Jay. Well, uh, shock and awe are, <laughs> are, are, are the words of the moment. Um, I, I just can't tell you how honored I am uh, to receive this award. Uh, this is the community that I think is the most important to me uh, in my life. Um, I didn't have any forewarning of this. Uh, and so uh, you're not going to get a, uh, a wonderful video recounting the history of integrated assessment like Bill Nordhaus produced last year. Um, but I have to say that working within this community has been a great pleasure and 
this is the this is the group that I love. Uh, at times, uh, at times it's been extraordinarily exhilarating, and at other times it's uh, been absolutely terrifying. Um, and it's been a great ride, and it uh, it's been a, a wonderful honor. There are many uh, others that we haven't acknowledged. Uh, I don't want to start listing names because I'll be embarrassed uh, for leaving out uh, other giants. Um, I'll just say uh, one thing that uh, a while ago, um, one of our colleagues and, and another of the pioneers of integrated assessment once introduced me as uh, uh, someone who had been working uh, on the climate problem for 40 years um, and still hadn't solved it. Uh, and so, I, uh, I think that that uh, uh, was quite quite a, a perceptive uh, comment. Uh, there's a lot of work left to be done. Uh, and I look forward to uh, working with everyone here in the community. Fortunately, the community has grown to the point where I think we have the, uh, the brain power to, uh, to, to actually solve this climate problem. And um, I look forward to uh, to working with everyone uh, going forward until the problem is solved. <laughs> so Excellent. thank you, thank you for, uh, from the bottom of my heart. We we have uh, Jay right back at you. We have no doubt that you will either solve it yourself or inspire others uh, to do so. Uh, and I would say on uh, right back at you again. Uh, this now becomes a career highlight uh, for me personally, and perhaps others, probably others on. So in uh, turning the uh, program uh, control back again to Detlev, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the great work of the Secretariat uh, this year, uh, this year of uh, challenges in, in particular, putting together this online uh, conference. And last but not least, in transitioning back to uh, Detlev, um, uh, acknowledge his uh, tireless role in uh, being the head of the program committee. Uh, you see in public a lot of evidence of that, but let me tell you the the uh, work he's done behind the scenes, making sure everything was set up correctly and then worked executed uh, well these past four days. Uh, he's been absolutely uh, tireless and working. Uh, I'm still getting, uh, e hopefully next week this will stop, emails at, uh, in the middle of the uh, night, uh, his time, which is a little bit more convenient my time. Uh, so with that, thanks to Monica, Sylvia, and Detlev, and I'm turning control back over to Detlev, who also might want to say uh, words of thanks to Jay and uh, his uh, transitioning into the uh, close for the overall meeting, Detlev. Thanks, thanks very much. Yeah, so, so first of all, congratulations to Jay as well. Um, and let me get a bit on the conference. Uh, so uh, as a result of COVID this year, we really uh, had to do this online. Um, it was a nice experiment, I think. Um, at the same time, it has a, a number of advantages. It allows for much larger participation that we had. Uh, at the beginning of the con conference, 350 participants. Um, and uh, I've also heard from many people that the content of the conference was excellent. And so in many of the parallel sessions, things were really, really nicely discussed and we had very good presentations. But at the same time, it's also a learning experiment and we need to learn how to uh, use uh, new infrastructure. Um, I'm really sorry about how the conference started at the very first day, uh, where we clearly had some um, problems with the uh, infrastructure to uh, learn. And um, I also would like to say to presenters or poster presenters that experienced uh, problems uh, with the infrastructure, uh, if you want to uh, let us know and we uh, would like to also uh, respond to that. At the same time, I think overall, uh, we had a very good conference and uh, in the parallel sessions, I think things were really, really smoothly and also today in the plenary, things went uh, reasonably well. Um, so I think also as a group, by the way, we have to start learning how to do things uh, in online. Um, 
And so I heard that in some sessions, the Q&A tab would work perfectly and that there was lots of discussion via the Q&A. In some other sessions, I, uh, I felt that it was a bit slowish still. And so we might want to learn how to, to really take the benefits of the fact that you can ask much more questions than in a normal uh, real world setting. Um, we also, yeah, compared to the real uh, conference, we obviously missed the social interaction. Um, uh, that's really a big disadvantage, not being able after the session to chat with people, uh, also to or to hear people respond uh, to things that we say here. Uh, but there's also another advantage. There's another advantage that this is much more sustainable. And so possibly uh, after this conference, we have to evaluate a little bit uh, the conference, how it went this year, and maybe see whether uh, we um, can hybrid forms in future conferences as well. Over, uh, overall, I think uh, the conference also has shown how our community is developing again. Uh, I've seen a lot of new innovations, uh, people working, uh, going towards um, machine learning. Uh, uh, and for instance, the, SD, the sustainable development session, while that was two years ago still about climate mitigation and then the potential uh, co-benefits uh, for air pollution, and uh, now you have had several presentations that really talked about how to achieve multiple goals. And so I think our community is clearly developing still in many areas. So that means that also for me, I would like to end up with uh, some, some thanks. Um, so I really want to uh, thank the uh, program committee that helped uh, organizing uh, this uh, conference today. I really would like to thank as well the scientific steering group of the IMC, which uh, has a lot of uh, contributions to organizing this. I also would like to uh, thank the speakers. Uh, without them, obviously, there isn't a conference. Uh, and this includes also the poster presenters and finally the audience. And so I think uh, that uh, also made this uh, conference work. Yeah, I think I look back and I think it's been a successful conference, maybe a little bit different than previous years. But uh, OK, let's uh, do it different again in 2021. So uh, since I see my two colleagues, Jay and uh, Detlev, uh, on stage right now, I would like to sneak in one last word. I'd like to call for a uh, long and pronounced uh, virtual standing ovation for these two gentlemen you see before you. So just imagine that in, in, in your minds and stand up and uh, put your hands together. Uh, with that, I think, Detlev, is it OK to uh, end since you're the uh, master of this ship for the uh, annual conference. Thank you, uh, as Stetlev has uh, listed out, uh, one and all for making this a yet another successful IMC annual meeting. And hopefully, uh, we'll get to see you in person next year, maybe, which I think uh, we're still debating this. But I think as it was going to be in College Park, actually, conveniently at Jay's place uh, <laughs> next year, hopefully, uh, hopefully by then, uh, the vaccines will work and the uh, the, uh, the uh, social resistance to wearing masks will wear out. Well, either one or both of those will occur and we'll be able to uh, see each other. I, I do have this feeling now to shake some hands and give people a big hug so we can uh, do that uh, virtually as well. And I see now we have Roberto on also. So standing ovations uh, all around. Uh, crescendo, uh, uh, Ar Arpeggio, uh, with with emphasis, uh, I can barely remember my uh, music training. So uh, with that, Detlev, do you want to say the final uh, Latin uh, phrase for uh, we are now finished? Uh, <laughs> so thank you uh, one and all for participating. And we look forward to seeing you either in person or online uh, next year, if not before. <laughs>